All right, Blender 5.0 is here. It's a really big version. Usually when the updates release, we do like a little video where I look through the feature release page here and discuss what's new. I might skim over things a little bit this time just because I've got a lot of work to do. But it's an interesting one because there are some huge geometry nodes changes and improvements and shader nodes improvements. So much so that it's allowing us to rebuild a bunch of the shader tools we've made for Blender, especially hex scatter, because they were originally built around Blender's limitations in terms of things like image texture inputs and like a lack of repeat zones and stuff like that but now that's changed but also there are some controversial ui changes especially in regards to node groups where for example i might be able to show you this okay let's say my theme doesn't look great on this at the moment but uh, i'll make a material let's grab a few nodes make a group out of them node groups now again sorry if the text is a bit hard to read they don't have the icon anymore to open in, into a node group they've just got this little kind of shadowing thing going on now a lot of people hate this and i'm also not a fan of it. The idea is the node groups will look like regular nodes but the thing is if you've got a large node group it's hard to distinguish between what's a node group and what's not usually there used to be that icon there now you have to like double click on the node group and i'm not sure if the kind of up arrow has also moved but it's up there in the corner as well so you've got to double click go back and i think the main complaint there is that it's just not distinguished enough from regular nodes which i do have to agree with i miss there being like a one click way of getting into it anyway let's scroll down so as usual they have their own recap video hosted primarily by jonathan Lampel. Harry Blends is also included in that. By the way, I recommend watching Harry Blends video on their channel, breaking down all the GeoNodes changes. Blender 5.0 introduces an overhauled color management pipeline, which natively supports wide gamut and HDR color spaces. So one thing to note about this is if you are using the Rec 2020, which is a new color working space, it will warn you when changing that it will need to convert the color values inside of materials. So to match renders with the previous working space as closely as possible, colors in all materials lights and geometry must be converted so this isn't just as simple as changing like the view transform like as if i was doing agx chronos pbr aces etc it does need to do a bit of a conversion in the file which i imagine might be a little bit annoying for some people but it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference with support for linear rec 2020 and aces cg it's now possible to get a wider gamut of colors for materials lights and compositing to follow common aces workflows so you can see here it just feels like there's a bit more of a subtle saturation that's allowed by the wider gamut so when you're setting the working space for the color that's done on a per file basis or you can convert between color spaces in the compositor with the convert color space node so blender 5.0 includes essential support for aces 1.3 and 2.0 workflows so that just brings it more into line with like you know regular visual effects color pipelines this covers most needs when working with the aces pipeline but for more complete support the official configurations can be manually installed and set through the ocio environment variable now, I know that this is all quite important for a lot of people. I'm not really super interested in color spaces that much. For me, it's just a matter of how does it look on the screen for doing general 3D artwork. But I know for a lot of professional workflows, people are quite obsessed with aces. So the sky is not the limit. The sky texture now supports multiple scattering, providing more realistic effects procedurally out of the box. Now, I'm more interested in this. So here we can see the multiple scattering going on in the environment. Looks pretty nice on the horizon. It's quite strong here by default. But again, if you pass it through a background node, you can and like manually decrease the strength so you can see what's happening there in a bit more detail comparing this to the single scattering we can see that the single scattering is far more basic and a lot of the time it just felt a bit too orange if that makes sense but you could also control like the atmospheric values with the multiple scattering it looks more detailed and we get more of a color gradient however you won't always see this sorry i was testing color spaces here but i'm going to show you something just out of curiosity so what I've done here is I've got a very narrow band of light coming through the wall here. And this is on the multiple scattering. And here we can actually see the gradation of color, right? So we've got some orangey and then some blue scattering down. If I go to the single scattering mode, the old one, we kind of lose that a little bit. Not entirely, but you can see that it's more of like a yellow to blue, multiple, slightly more complex range, bounces off the edge there. One thing I find interesting though, changing the color transform, or rather the view transform, however you want to call it. In AGX, we see that quite a pretty gradient actually. If I go to Kronos PBR neutral, it almost disappears. Not entirely, but it kind of clamps it a lot. And then down to Aces 2.0, it's there, but we're much more darker by default. So I'm just still trying to decide like on a 3D art level, what kind of view transform am I going to be working with going forward? Like if I'm just doing social media animations or something. For me, the only thing I really care about is A, how bounce lighting looks since I use that a lot and B, how emissive things look. So again, looking at a harsh color point, Aces 2.0, 
Compared to standard, remember standard was terrible. Aces is a good range. Kronos PBR looks better, to be honest, for a mission. And AGX feels like we get some like lower contrast details. I'm not sure what to go for. Because again, with AGX, it feels like we're keeping some like extra specularity that we lose in the Kronos and there's just nothing in aces. Sorry, this is a bit of a rambling. Anyway, the new sky model works great for reflections indoors. You might look at that and go, oh yeah, that looks like a huge difference. But to be honest, that's mostly just brightness. But it is undeniably more a more realistic option. Generate a sunset scene instantly by animating only one parameter. So that'd be the sun elevation. It does look good. Actually, one other way to kind of see the difference is just to keep an eye on the ground level. Because again, in the single scattering, we get this bleed that just looked a bit weird. In multiple scattering, much nicer. Okay, radial tiling is now in the shader editor, which is handy for everyone trying to do like procedural or semi-procedural patterns. Looks good. Multi-res baking. Baking from meshes that used a multi-resolution modifier has been greatly improved. Added support for vector displacement. That's quite complicated. Support for end gons, pick only to selected and active images. None of issues resolved. Baking in Blender is something where there's quite a lot of room for improvement in terms of usability. So anything's appreciated. Okay, this is important. Repeat zones for the shading nodes. So that brings it into line with geometry nodes for repeat zones. EV supports dynamic iteration count, while cycles is limited to a fixed number at the moment with plans to improve this in the future. The example of using frag tools and remarching is a good use case. If you think about being able to do like recursive math operations and stuff like that, it will allow for all sorts of like details and patterns. Very cool. The new bundles and closure nodes is very important. So it feels a bit weird that it's kind of a bit of a footnote here. This is what will finally allow us to be able to do things such as swapping out bundles of images as inputs, which is why hex scatter are procedural, like triplanar, non seamless, two seamless scattering tool uh, had to be so complex in terms of nodes and having to build a preamble version of the nodes because doing multiple image inputs was so annoying, but bundles effectively solves that problem. Added support for a menu switch node. This is good for kind of choosing different properties in node groups as well. Like if you have different modes of doing something and you want to bundle them all into one group. Unbiasedly smooth, new unbiased null scattering volume rendering algorithm is default removes blocky artifacts in overlapping volumes and eliminates the need for step size, max steps, and homogeneous volume settings. Cool, not much else to say about that. It just looks better. Subsurface scattering has been improved. We can see here there are some issues with the old algorithm where around certain thin or overlapping areas you'd get some odd artifacts. That's now been fixed with the multi bounce method. It just takes a little bit longer to render. The physically based iridescence effects caused by dielectric thin film introduced in Blender 4.2 LTS is now supported by Metals 2, as in in the metallic BSDF and principal BSDF. Cool, I'll need to play with that. Would be good for my uh, modular metals, which needs a rebuild. Subdivide and conquer. Now, this is funny. Adaptive subdivision is no longer an experimental feature. See, it was always listed as experimental in Blender for a reason I don't think anyone knew why. But yes, the running joke was the adaptive subdivision will never leave experimental, even though we were all using it. I think it's been there for the best part, like 10 years or something. God knows. If you don't know, you would have to set Blender into uh, using an experimental tool set in like the render settings to have the option to use adaptive subdivision, which dynamically tessellates a mesh based on A, the camera position and B, or rather the camera frustrum and be the shader settings if it was using displacement. So it's nice to see that it's being accepted as just an inbuilt feature now. It features a new object space option to set edge length in object space instead of pixel size. It allows object instancing to use minimal memory by subdividing the mesh once, independent of camera size and instancing it many times. Okay, this was a funny one. Better optics denoiser quality. There was a weird thing they figured out where if you flip the image before denoising it, you get a better result than not doing that. It's explained by Patrick here. I won't try and explain it because I don't understand, but people thought it was quite funny. A reminder to donate to Blender. You may know recently we did a video sharing the donation push and that video blew up a little bit. I think we had one of the largest impacts on the Blender dev fund graph. I asked Francesco from the Blender Foundation who gave me the link to use for that video um, if he could share what the link said because I was actually quite interested in seeing how many people go through the video to donate, but I haven't heard back from him yet. But they have been busy releasing this version of Blender. But you might be curious to see that as well. So if he does ever get back to me, I will see about sharing that information. So Eevee, quick start, materials compile faster. Okay, that was quite important, let's be fair. One of my main complaints about new Eevee was just how long it took. It's probably still not 
Great. Material compilation time in seconds. What would it be down to? 30 to 40 seconds on Vulcan. I don't know what demo that's using here, like as a control, but, you know, a step in the right direction for Vulcan, that's not much of a time change for OpenGL. That is quite a large change, but still too long, I would say. Though it does say configurations using NVIDIA and Vulcan backend are up to four times faster. I'm sure they'll keep working at it over time. 3D viewport, better Mac caps, no cap. Updated Mac caps include optional specular light. So this was interesting because when I did open my startup file between version four and version five, I did make a note to myself saying, huh, the viewport looks a little bit different. I think that was because of a Mac cap change. Okay, what else here? Image texture node supports 32-bit HDR. That's pretty good. Faster light probe volume baking, up to three times faster overlays of mesh instances. Okay, so this was quite cool as well. New demo files have been updated in regards to the asset bundles, and there's a human skeleton base mesh asset, which means we don't need to go looking for the Z Anatomy resource anymore. Use it to study, practice, or even in commercial projects. It's public domain. Very good. So especially for those of us doing like Scyvis stuff going into the future, it's a good platform to work with and to improve upon. There are experiments I wanted to do with skeletons relating to my kind of physical definition material so maybe i'll download that soon compositor oh yeah so there are new presets in the compositor you'll find that when you open the compositor there's a little shelf now like an asset shelf at the bottom and from there you can drag in these effects and use them very cool chromatic aberration oh yes the most overused effect in graphics but to be honest i love how it looks as well split toning let's check that out nice and tune image oh cool that's pretty nice. So boosting clarity in that. I didn't think they'd ever add anything like that. But, you know, just a, a little bit of extra, you know, contrast, brightness, clarity can really, really improve a render. Obviously, I mean, this is more for like general fun rather than professional use cases, I'd imagine. But still, I like that. And these are node groups as well. So you can go into them and have a little look at how they work. Actually, let's have a quick peruse. Let me get rid of my emissive sphere. Let's set this to AGX. Let me set this to optics as well. Apparently there was better quality with that that change, that flipping change. Comparing open image denoise, is that a little bit slower? Seems about the same speed. I think optics is a bit better. Okay, so from here let's enable, yeah, compositor is enabled in the camera. I've got a little bit of bloom. Let's open this up. So here's my compositor. At the moment, I've got a bloom node going on, as you can see, a little bit of strength. So what would like sensor noise do, for example? Okay, so it's just adding a little bit of extra noise in. That's cool. A little bit of that could be nice, a bit tasteful for renders. Oh, you can animate it as well. Cool. So if I go to tune image, let's try this. And then I can boost the clarity and the detail and a bit of a color boost. Ooh. Okay. But if you double click on it, then we can have a look at how it works in here. Although because these things are grayed out, that means that this is like a linked asset. So you may need to make it local in some way. I'm not sure how you would do that through the compositor. That's actually one of my complaints about the asset system recently is this behavior by default. I actually despise it not to be too negative same thing with just dragging things in from the asset browser you would think that people would want to modify the things that they drag in as soon as possible say if i brought in like a display case using the default settings you're like nice okay by the way this is from the new afterglow update you think cool a i can't modify it because it's linked in but i can unpack it with my modular workspaces add-on and with that add-on we've done it so it makes things local by default so you know i could select things and modify it straight up you know, without needing to worry. But if I undo things, so I've just got the asset as I dragged it in. If I then make instances real and then click on the materials in here, we can't modify them because it's not local. Now, obviously there are settings here. You've got link, append, pack, got it set to follow preferences. So in theory, doing the append mode, because you're literally just adding it works. So you would need to set that. But I believe by default, that's not how it works in the preferences. So that's just always one thing to keep in mind because I know some people, they watch old videos about the asset products and then they start using them in the newer versions of Blender and then they go, wait, why can't I modify this? It's because they change the behaviors over time. And sometimes these micro changes, they do make things a bit more difficult for people to use. So there's a lot of stuff that's happened in the compositor, which is good. VFX reference platform ready, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so Grease Pencil has a motion blur effect now. Cool for all the animators out there. Sharp corners ahead. Grease Pencil strokes can now have different corner types. And these can be set per point as well. So that's more like, you know, vector control, I suppose. So there's flat, sharp, and round, which is the default. More control there is always appreciated. Cyclical strokes now correctly connect start and end segments without gaps or overlaps. Nice. And there's a video by Mumu Mundo talking about the new features in Grease Pencil. Worth a watch. 
interpolation tool support for Bezier and Cutmill ROM curve types. All just nice stuff. Apparently the sequencer here, the video sequence editors had quite a lot of changes as well. Blender 5.0 brings an unprecedented integration of the video sequencer across different areas. So there's like new areas in the interface where settings can be changed and modified, basically just making it more cohesive across a workspace. So strip properties now appear where you'd expect them. The properties editor, as you can see with the side buttons, a dedicated strip tab contains all the settings previously located in the sequence editor sidebar, or they're just calling it the sequencer here. You can add relevant modifiers as well. Oh, is this from Martin Kleckner? Yes, it is. Look at me. I can recognize people based on their work. Previously, the sequencer was tied to whichever scene was currently active. With Blender 5.0, you can now choose a different scene for the sequencer, allowing multi-scene workflows. Turn on the new sync scene time option to switch the active scene as you scrub through your edits. Now they keep calling it the sequencer, but am I right? It's a sequencer in the video sequencer, okay. Sliding or slipping strips, now clamp to the contents limits by default, can be overridden by pressing C for clamp. New playback controls, a region built in the sequencer and other animation editors, no need to have a timeline editor just for playback. Okay, that's good. That's one reason why I would always have a little timeline open. Okay, the power of hundreds of nodes from Blender's production-ready compositor is now available in the video sequencer. Meet your new favorite modifier. Oh, so you can have a compositor modifier. Ah, that, that's pretty clever. I'm wondering if I'll ever be able to move over to using Blender as my main editor. It would need to have, I don't know if we can do this, but drag and drop support for images into the sequencer. Maybe it can do that, maybe it can't. That's a pretty essential part of my editing workflow is being able to drag things in from the file explorer. But you know, it's not necessarily built for that. Okay, so I can drag an image in, but can I move it around? I'll look into it. Okay, so they've got a video demonstrating using the sequencer for storyboarding. That's pretty cool. Oh, the array modifiers had some large updates as well, so you can randomize things. I was actually wondering about that just a few days ago, actually. So that's pretty cool. And an important one here is being able to align the rotation to a point. Brilliant. UV editing's had an overhaul. Now things sync between the editors by default. So if you choose in one, the selection will be visible in the 3D view. So you don't have to enable that separately. There are other changes there as well. The extension platform keeps growing. Very nice. That reminds me I need to update my theme for 5.0. Uh, when I do that, I will add that to my startup file on Gumroad. New features were added to the movement system in the VR scene inspection. I've never actually tried that. Maybe I'll give it a try when Valve's new headset comes out. I do have a Vive, like the old HTC Vive, but it's a bit of a hassle to set up. But that's pretty cool. And finally, there is more. So all of the smaller changes. Uh, one important thing to keep in mind, though, is that the .dae file extension uh, support has been dropped for that now. So anyone that was using that in their workflow needs to keep that in mind. I believe you can reinstall support for it, probably in the form of an extension. You might need to double check that. But that is just one thing to remember. Oh yeah, the volume grid and SDF nodes. That is again, another big thing for geometry nodes. We're allowed to do all sorts of different effects with this now. It kind of feels weird that being relegated to a footnote on this main page now, because that's huge. But you'll hear about these things in the videos by other creators. Again, I recommend you watch Harry Blend's video. Breaking changes, of course. Typical note for me to make here is that if you are trying any of my add-ons in Blender 5.0 and you notice a bug, don't be surprised, but let me know as soon as possible through whatever means. I'm on Discord or if you can find me on Superhive, you can connect through there or social media. Just keep in mind that for most of my add-on projects, I'm a one-man army. For some projects, there's someone else that can help occasionally, but I don't test every add-on for every new version of Blender, so I only become aware of the bugs when I bump into them or when someone else bumps into them. So just let me know if there's anything that comes up. Like I said as well, we are actively working to update some of the resources for Blender 5.0 now that new functionality has been allowed, specifically Hex Scatter. That's going to be a really good one. With the 5.0 update, I am quite confident in saying that Hex Scatter will be the most powerful projection and scattering node ever made for Blender which is quite a confident statement, but you just wait and see what those bundles and closures allow for. Because it really kind of redefines how we can select different modes of action, like scattering, and again, bundling image inputs for PBR workflows into like a smaller number of larger node groups. So it's going to be really interesting to work with. Again, you're welcome to check out any of my other projects like Afterglow, Modular Workspaces, and we have a whole bunch of extra demonstration projects on my members lounge for Silver Tier patrons. So thank you for watching everyone. Have fun with Blender 5. If you would like to post an emoji in the comments, post anything winter related since we're kind of getting to December. Although I know that's mostly for the Northern Hemisphere. Have a great day everyone and I'll see you next time.